Greetings from the Jazz Cloud. I'm Richie Zellon, and I'm happy to welcome you to the Jazz Guitar Channel. Last week, I was very saddened to hear that one of the all-time greats in the history of jazz guitar passed away. And of course, you know I'm referring to Pat Martino, who will not only be remembered as a major influence by guitarists worldwide, but also as a wonderful human being to those who had the good fortune of getting to know him. I first met Pat Martino during the summer of 1977 while studying at Berklee College of Music in Boston. And he was already one of my heroes. And when I found out that he would be performing for several days at the now defunct jazz workshop on Boylston Street, I couldn't wait to hear him. And it turned out to be a very low profile gig on which he just played duets with Bobby Rose, a guitarist who, who he previously recorded with on what was already one of my favorite albums, The Visit. And by the way, if you're interested, a number of years ago, a live CD was released from the tour under the name Alone Together. But to make a long story short, the very first night Pat performed at the jazz workshop, I approached him during one of his breaks and asked him for lessons to which he agreed. And it so happened that he was staying for a week at a motel which was walking distance from my apartment. So it turned out to be very convenient. So as my personal tribute to Pat, what I want to share with you throughout this video is what he taught me during my brief studies with him that week. Before I begin, on a side note, I'd like to add that this was before Pat had the aneurysm which made him lose his memory, and as a result, like most of you know, he later had to relearn to play the guitar. This period was also briefly after Pat recorded Joyous Lake, his only fusion album. So Pat was exploring some new directions in his music. And I especially mention this because one of the memories that stand out from my initial conversations with him in his motel room was his excitement regarding his then current project. He had recorded an atonal orchestral, orchestral composition he wrote, which was played entirely on synthesizers. It had no guitar or percussion. And I remember him playing it for me on a cassette player and thinking, wow, <laughs> it was a humbling experience because I was just a 20 something year old learning to play jazz. And here was one of my guitar heroes taking the time to expose me to this stuff, which was way over my head to say the least. So after listening to it, he tells me all excited that he had gotten the opportunity to play the recording for Stockhausen. And for those of you not familiar with this name, he is regarded as one of the great 20th century avant-garde composers in classical music circles. Anyhow, Pat said Stockhausen dug his music. So this is a side of Pat Martino's music that most are not familiar with. But needless to say, this project was not at all jazz and never saw the light of day. Another conversation I recall having with Pat was about the I Ching, which I had briefly also meddled with. And I must add that this got started in relationship to Pat's application of music theory, as we'll see next, because he was really into hexagrams and numerical permutations. The first thing Pat taught me was how to derive all chord families from a four-part diminished form. Unlike conventional music theory that treats the major scale as the mother scale, Pat used the symmetrical diminished octatonic scale as the seed to generate any chord form. So here we can see in his own handwriting the first sheet that he wrote out for me explaining this concept. At the top left, we have an E diminished chord spelled out. By lowering each one of the notes in the diminished chord a half step down, we can generate four different dominant seventh chords. Furthermore, below the quadrant, he explains that if we place three diminished chords with their roots a half step apart, like an E, 
F and F sharp. By applying this concept to each chord, we'll generate dominant seventh chords in all 12 keys. And before I demonstrate this on the guitar, let me show you the continuation of this study in a second sheet where you'll see that he concludes at the top that if you lay out the four inversions of the diminished chord across the fretboard, you can generate a total of 60 dominant seventh chords using the previous procedure. So let me begin by saying that all the voicings in this study are drop two voicings. And I'm sure all of you know what a drop voicing is, but just in case for any newbies out there, a drop two voicing is when you take the second uh, note from the top in a chord, usually a four part chord, and bring it down an octave. And we do this for two reasons. Uh, most of the time, some of these uh, chord voicings are almost impossible to play on the guitar because of the stretches required as what I'm going to show you next. And number two, we can also derive new sonorities from these uh, special inversions by dropping uh, certain notes down an octave. So, if we take a G diminished uh, chord in, in, in its natural non-inverted state, it would be... Now, notice that I'm using an open string to play the uh, diminished seventh on the first string. That's because it is basically impossible to play on guitar. We can't stretch that far. So what we do, we bring the second string in this case, the second note from the top, down an octave, and this C sharp would now come down here. And that first string, which was open now, is placed on the second string, and we have this diminished drop two voicing. Now we can start working with this concept. And in essence, it works like this. You take each one of the uh, notes and bring them down a half step. And whatever that new note that you have becomes the root of a dominant chord. So if we bring down the lowest note in this diminished shape down a half step, we end up with a C7. Back here. Now we're going to bring down the uh, the fourth string, and we end up in F sharp dominant seventh with the root on the fourth string. Let's go back to our original diminished shape. Now we're going to bring down the third string here, a half step down. A7 dominant chord with the root on the third string. And finally, going back to our original shape, we're going to bring down the, the second string a half step. We have to rearrange our fingers for that. And we end up with an E flat dominant seventh chord with the root on the second string. So there we have our four dominant seventh chords derived from one diminished seventh shape. And like Pat said, if we bring that same shape, the diminished shape that is up a half step and apply the same procedure, we'll derive another four chords. If we bring it up one additional half step, and apply that procedure, we'll derive another four dominant seven shapes. So in the three diminished shape forms, a half step apart, we derive all 12 keys for dominant sevenths. 
Now, the next thing that Pat taught me was how to use this same procedure after we have our dominant chords to turn those dominant chords into any other chord family. And I'm going to show you this uh, using uh, dominant seventh to minor seventh chords and dominant seventh to major seventh chords. So starting again, the same shape here. If we bring down the uh, bottom note a half step, we have a C7. Now, if we identify the uh, third on this chord, which is on the second string, and bring that down, we have a minor seventh chord with the root on the fifth. Now, going back to the dominant seventh, we identify our, our minor seventh here and bring it up a half step, we have a major seventh chord. So, doing the same thing with the next string on the original diminished shape, we bring this one down, the fourth string down a half step, and we have an F sharp dominant seven. Now our major third is here, so bring that down a half step, and we have an F sharp minor seventh chord. Go back to that dominant seventh chord, identify the... Uh, flatted seventh, which is here on the second string, bring that up a half step, and we have an F sharp major seventh. Uh, we go to uh, our original diminished shape and bring down now the uh, third string a half step, and we have an A7 dominant. So this is our major third here on the uh, fifth string, bring that down step and we have a minor seventh, an A minor seventh with the root on the third string. Go back to our go back to our dominant seventh in A and identify the major seventh which is here. Bring that up a half step and we have an A major seventh. And finally going back to our original diminished shape bring down the, the uh, second string a half step and we have an E flat dominant this is our major third bring that down a half step and we have a, an E flat minor seventh chord going back to the uh, E flat dominant seventh if we want to turn this into a major seventh we need to identify where our seventh is, which in this case is here on the fifth string. But unfortunately, when we bring it up on this inversion, it doesn't really work because this is a no-no in harmony because we create a minor ninth between that seventh and the root, which is not something we normally play. So that's how it works, and you can do this for any chord family just by altering uh, any of the notes in those four dominants that we derive from the uh, one diminished shape. Next, in order to come up with all the possibilities playable on the fretboard, he suggested organizing the strings into four parts symmetric and non-symmetric groups as we can see in this sheet. So he first showed me how to do this using a dominant chord on what he called the D group, which is a non-symmetric group consisting of strings six, four, three, and two. And since the sixth string is the same as the first string, we can automatically invert this set to string group A, which consists of strings four, three, two, and one. Both string groups provide eight different forms for any four-part chord, including its inversions. And this is something Pat learned from his mentor, Dennis Sandoli, growing up in Philly. So conventionally, you can play uh, four-part chords and their inversions in five string groups on the guitar. Uh, the first one, or what Pat called 
uh, string group A would be one, two, three, four. String group B would be two, three, four, five. String group C would be three, four, five, six. These are the symmetric groups. And then we have two uh, non-symmetric groups. Letter D or string group D consists of two, three, four, and six, uh, muting the uh, first and the fifth string, and then letter uh, E, which consists of strings one, two, three, and five, muting the fourth and the sixth. And Pat starts teaching you this concept uh, using uh, string group D, which is what I just described, two, three, four, and six, and he'll take a diminished shape. In this case, this is an A diminished seventh, drop voicing, and you'll notice that if you take the uh, sixth string and transfer it over to the uh, first string, you have a different shape or different voicing for the same chord. So based on that premise, if you um, take each note in this diminished shape and lower it down a half step, first you'll have, in this case, this A flat, if you transfer this sixth string to the uh, first string, you have this voicing here. If we bring down the uh, fourth string a half step, we have to rearrange our fingers. Now we have an F dominant seventh. And notice if we transfer the uh, sixth string to the uh, first string, this classic dominant seventh voicing. The Robert Johnson chord. <laughs> okay, going back to the original diminished shape now, let's bring the uh, third string down a half step. And we have this dominant shape, which by the way is a, a B7 with the uh, with the seventh, the flatted seventh in the bass. But if we bring the, the flatted seven up to the uh, first string, we have this voicing. And finally, going back to our diminished shape, if we bring the second string down a half step, we have this very well-known shape. In this case, we have a D7. The sixth string, we transfer it to the first string, we have this voicing. So the other thing that Pat teaches once you understand this concept is that you've got four areas that you can work with to derive all these voicings. So that's how you get all the four inversions. So basically, if you're doing uh, this uh, diminished shape, it inverts itself symmetrically up in minor thirds. So those are the uh, four inversions of this shape. I hope you're enjoying this lesson and deriving value from it. If so, please click on that like button. And if this is your first time on the Jazz Guitar Channel, be sure to subscribe. Another interesting but somewhat elusive concept Pat taught me was how to expand line forms. And as we can see at the top of his notes on this sheet, he also started with a diminished arpeggio in order to teach this concept. He basically said we can expand any line in our present vocabulary throughout a range of two and a half octaves. Nonetheless, to come up with a good result, later I came to realize that this requires lots more knowledge than what meets the eye here in this sheet. Here he demonstrated the concept by creating a two and a half octave stationary F sharp diminished arpeggio seen here with the stems up 
while filling the spaces between its notes with a G diminished arpeggio, seen here with the stems down. At the bottom, he showed the different interval combinations that result using an F sharp as the root. In this sheet, he notated three studies he assigned in order to develop different interval permutations in three octaves against a given root. Now, while this will get you to look and better understand intervals throughout the fretboard, I have to admit after all these years that it did not in the least help me become a better jazz player. Who knows, maybe there was some prior information that Pat took for granted when he set out to teach me this, or maybe it's only meant to develop a tonal or polytonal lines, which is something he appeared to be exploring at the time. Regardless, I was too intimidated to ask him or question its purpose at the time. But in all honesty, when I look back, I have to admit that throughout the years, I have learned much more from transcribing and analyzing Pat's lines than from his actual teaching, which could be a little too esoteric at times for some of us. <laughs> Regardless, I am very grateful that I had the opportunity to learn from him and be touched by his music. So I just want to say thanks, Pat rest in peace. And I have no doubt that many of you share this sentiment. Therefore, before I conclude, I want to take this opportunity to ask any of you who met Pat to share with us any memorable anecdotes you may have in the comment section below. This way, we can all remember and celebrate Pat Martino's life together. I hope you have enjoyed this lesson, and as usual, I welcome your likes and comments. Again, if this is your first time on the Jazz Guitar Channel, be sure to click on that subscribe button. I'm Richie Zellon, and it's time to say, hasta la vista, stay safe, and peace be with you.